All right, good morning. I see some back row Baptists back there, some present Presbyterians, all right, some charismatic Catholics, and we're all in the house today. And if you're agnostic, you're good too. We all love somebody somewhere. All right, I am your session host. My name is Christina Grimion. You can tell I'm a JAMF employee, and I have the pleasure of bringing in this great team from Second Life Mac, specifically, Miss Ray, but before I do that, we have some housekeeping. We're doing things differently when it comes to Q&A this year. So grab your device, uh, your iPhone, your, your Mac, your, uh, your iPad, because this year everyone, whether you're virtual or whether you're in person, can participate in Q&A. Now Miss Ray has some questions that she's going to present or pose to you outside of the Q&A, but if you would go to your app, and locate the session, you will find session Q&A in the app. And I'm sorry I can't mirror with an Apple TV, but this is not my show, okay? But look for session Q&A, and when you find session Q&A, locate this session. This session is Investment Strategies for Digital Learning Devices. This is gonna be good. I fought for this in my former district. I really did. I fought hard, like Rocky. I did, but um, it was some politics I couldn't overcome. But it is a great investment strategy. Okay, guys. All right. Any questions about the Q and A? All right. So without further ado, I am going to introduce the lovely, beautiful, very sweet lady. I just met her like. 30 minutes ago, I feel like she's my bestie. And her name is Miss Ray Niles. Give her a hand. Are you sure you don't want to just stay up here with me? Because I think we could do a pretty good gig here. Um, so uh, make sure this all works here. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, just a couple slides kind of about um, who Second Life Mac is, who I am. My name is um, Dr. Ray Niles. I was a former Apple um, employee, worked as the um, person that took care of Apple professional learning. I led that team for many years at Apple. I fun tired, and if you don't know what fun tireman is, fun tireman is when you're not really old enough to retire, but you're old enough to say peace out, and you get to do the things you want to do. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about is helping educators really think about the time and effort and, and even the financial investment they're making in the use of technology. And so being able to share some of that with you today is really important, but it's also it also resonates because everybody Everybody wants to work smarter, not harder, and we want to maximize how that works. So um, I am here today on behalf of Second Life Mac, and uh, you'll hear more about Second Life Mac specifically when Paula comes up and, and chats with you as well. But Second Life Mac, um, as many of you know, they purchase um, Apple equipment um, from schools. So if that's something that you're here today to learn more about and you don't get your questions answered, please by all means corner one of them and, and grab us so that we can visit with you. So I'm curious to know, um, when you think about um, school and you think about how your funds are being used, it's easy sometimes to think about how the equipment that we have laying around kind of looks like this car, right? It starts to kind of grow mold. It starts to look a little old and rusty. And you're thinking, nobody's going to buy this. Now, if I were to tell you that this is a highly collectible Volkswagen, that might change your mind, right? Wouldn't we all love to find something like that in our closet or in a hay barn or something that would give us that extra oomph? But let's dig a little bit deeper. How are we maybe moving? How are you currently um, thinking about how you're purchasing? Like, are you making decisions about how you purchase based on what you get in return? Now, this is kind of the interactive part of this, but have you noticed gas prices lately? At least where I live, gas prices have gone up. So I'm making choices about where I purchase my gas based on what I'm going to get in return. So where I live, if I shop at a certain grocery store, I get fuel points that then come across uh, on my gas as a cheaper gas price, right? I see a couple heads nodding. So um, can you think of other things that you're making decisions as consumers in how you're using um, kind of your buying power when you're out shopping? So I see a head nodding in the middle row there. Can you give me an example? 
Okay. 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 Okay, so the, the response was when he purchased his home, right in the middle of the screen, he thought about um, the school district he was going to be in. He thought about being able to resell that down the road. So clearly he was thinking about that as a consumer standpoint. How many of you flew to get here today? Ah, lots of hands go up in the room. When you chose the airline that you got on, if you had the choice yourself, you probably spent your money a little differently than if your school said you had to use this certain airline. But when you're flying for vacation or you're flying to go somewhere with your family, how are you making decisions on the airlines that you're using? Anybody doing that? Yeah, based on the, the cost advantage. Some people, go ahead. Oh, checked bags fees, right. You, right, because some airlines, you have to pay a fee to check a bag, absolutely. But when you think about um, choosing not only your airlines, your gas, your house, where I live, we choose where we go with the grandkids based on Chick-fil-A and the free sandwiches and the nuggets I get in the app, right? They've got me hooked because I know if I'm going to take the grandkids there, then I'm going to get something in return. We are making decisions like this constantly as consumers constantly, consciously and subconsciously, we are deciding that. Why as educators then are we not doing that as well? Why are we not thinking about how can I as an educator maximize the dollars that have been entrusted to me by our taxpayers? And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to uncover what that looks like and help you think through what those opportunities are. Now, specifically, when we start thinking about um, education, and we know that there's been a lot of changes in the last four years, what are the things that are keeping educators awake at night? And we can popcorn this. If you've got an answer, call it out. But what are the things that you either are married to somebody who's an educator, and you know it's keeping awake at night. You work with educators, and you know it's because they're telling you what's keeping them awake at night. But what are the things that are keeping educators awake at night? What are they worried about? Security, okay, security, what else? Safety, what else? Student accountability, what else? Learning outcomes? Access to resources, what else? Now we've done similar presentations like this um, probably six or seven different times. And it's been um, interesting to me to hear the types of things that are keeping people awake at night. One of the things that surprised me the most in a group that we were in um, on the East Coast, we had a group of superintendents, and the thing that rose to the top, which was completely not on my radar, was vaping. They were concerned about vaping. They were trying to figure out how in the world are we going to be able to keep our schools free of, of students using um, that were using cigarettes or vaping or things that they shouldn't have in school. Another uh, group of superintendents that we talked to, they said that what was keeping them awake at night was the potato harvest. And I was like, okay, I can go with this potato harvest, tell me more. And they said, no, we're worried because when we do potato harvest in the fall, a lot of our kids take off for harvest and they never come back. So they were worried about making sure that their students were being kept in school. There are lots and lots and lots of things on, our, on our, the minds of our educators and our school leaders. But there's also some things that we can take back that we've said we've learned as a result of the pandemic. So there's some things that we can kind of check off of our list. Those things include, we know that we have students that have missed an entire year or more of school, right? We know that they were gone. They were either MIA completely or they fell off the map somehow. We don't know where they went. They've missed an entire year of school. We also know that um, it was problematic for that remote learning opportunity. Some students had access. Some students didn't have access. Some students had devices, but they didn't have access. Some students had access, but they didn't have devices. It was glitchy. And if you had three or four or five kids in your family and mom and dad working remotely, it made it even more difficult, right? Because that bandwidth just shrunk that remote learning was no longer an opportunity. Also, we had unequal access, right? The students that lived in certain parts of town had better access than the students that lived in other parts of town. They lived out in the country, they maybe didn't have access. 
And then also, we know that some kids just literally fell off the radar. We don't know where they went. We don't know what happened to them. They're gone. And some of those students haven't come back yet. Now, if we know that about our students, what are the things that we've learned about our teachers? So prior to the pandemic, that well-being for our teachers and our students and the leaders of our school, we knew that was already in jeopardy. We knew that there were already problems we were facing. Study in 2014 out of Canada pointed out that 86% of Ontario's principals never had enough time to complete their work. Now, how many of you would say that now? Anybody? Uh, lots of heads. For those of you that are joining us virtually, the whole room has their heads shaking. Everybody would admit there's not enough time, right? Not only is there not enough time, but the study also said that three-fourths, or close to 72%, felt pressure to work those long hours. I don't know any educator that comes to work at 8 and is done at 3.30. They're there early, they stay late, they do stuff in the evenings, and they're doing stuff at night, right? So there's a lot of stress and a lot of pressure that's already built into the, to the profession just innately. And then lastly, 30% had self-medication to deal with the stress of the job. Now, what that self-medication is, I can't say. I don't know if it's alcohol. I don't know if it's drugs. I don't know if it's smoking. I don't know if it's just a good dose of caffeine here and there. But a third of our educators are feeling so stressed that they had to have something to help them deal with that. Also, 93% of the educators reported feeling exhausted at the end of each day. I would argue this number's probably low. And I would also remind you that this study occurred prior to the pandemic. So if that data existed prior to the pandemic, can we imagine how difficult it is now? They're facing a lot of things that they wouldn't have faced, and it's been magnified and it's been amplified. And for the teachers that we have currently in our system, think how many years they've taught with COVID. The spring of 20, Fall of 21, spring of 22, fall of 23. For them, it's four school years. They've had four different groups of kids that they've had to, to get through this, this entire process. Also, we know that teachers who care about their students and about making a difference, they, are, they have grieved the loss, the ability to connect on, together in, face, uh, in person. So that connectedness was a part of what helped teachers kind of make it through the day. I don't know how many of you were former educators or current educators. Couple hands in the room, okay. So I'm gonna pick on you, Miss Christine. So as an educator, I'm guessing that you knew the names of your kids and you greeted them at the door, definitely. And when you greet students on Zoom or you greet students on WebEx or you greet them, greet them through Google Meet, it's different, isn't it? Very different, because you're not getting the body language. You're not getting the, um, those subtle um, hints. There's no interaction, right? So you're missing out on that. And most of us that became educators didn't become educators for the money. We, came, we became educators because we loved kids and we loved that connection. So we also know that not only did COVID-19 impact us economically as a nation, but it also cut deeply into the um, psychic or the psyche rewards of teachers and teaching. It also intensified many existing problems related to educators' well-being. I know I'm say, it sounds like I'm painting a picture of doom and gloom, but I want you to realize some of the, the stresses that our teachers are under because I think we can help them move beyond that. The combined effect of those stresses has made anxiety, depression, and overall ill-being Ill being among educators even worse. And the studies that have supported all of this, it's across the board. There's nothing that's pointing out that it's different. And, and I noticed uh, a couple of you are shaking your heads. You're in agreement with that. So if we know that over the last four years, we faced some challenges that we really weren't prepared to face, and we've come through it on the other side, now we have to step back and ask ourselves, what do we want school to look like? Everybody's carrying around something, some type of technology. Do we want it to look just like it did 20 years ago, but with technology, or do we want it to look different? And when we ask ourselves, what do you want learning to look like in six months, 12 months, or 24? You have to ask yourself, what's the doing? What does the doing look like in six months, 12 months, or 24 months? 
how does that change what we're doing now that every student's carrying around some type of device? So I would argue that there are some opportunities available to us. One of which is goodbye to drive-by PD. Now, I don't know if you know what this is or not, but we've all been through a Starbucks line, right? Starbucks, the box squawks, you order your drink, and the next thing you know, you're at a window, you get your drink, and you drive off. Let's just put that into the perspective if you're in a classroom or in a school. Same type of thing. One presenter comes in, they talk to you for the day, squawk box turns on, they feed you lunch, the guy leaves at three, and the next day starts all over again, and you may or may not have absorbed anything that was said. We are also able to move from that homogeneous grouping to something that's much more personalized. If I know Paula needs help with one thing, then I've got PD that will help her with that. If I know Mark needs professional development in his content area, it's gonna help him with that. It's not a one size fits all, and it's no longer that sit and get. We learned that through the pandemic. We also know that there's less inspiration and more perspiration. Back in the day, 100 years ago, when I started in education, we used to get this like rock star person. They would find somebody, they'd come in, they'd get us all jazzed up and excited the first day of school. Then they'd leave, and we would count that as a professional development day. I'm not sure that made me a better teacher. It probably kept me more entertained, but it didn't make me a better teacher. The pandemic has allowed us to step back and say, no, we're going to work hard our kids deserve it, we deserve it, the profession deserves it. So it's no longer, you know, rah, rah, rah. It's like, roll up your sleeves, folks, let's get busy. It's also from evaluative to coaching. There's no longer that sense of gotcha. It's like, let's lock elbows. Let's sit shoulder to shoulder. Let's figure out what we need to do so that we can do it together. And then lastly, from fragmentation to focus. What that means is it's no longer a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. It's we're going to focus on literacy this year, and our focus on literacy is going to include these strategies. In my mind, this is something that should have happened a long time ago. It's sad that it took a pandemic for the profession to realize that this is what we need to be doing to help our teachers and to help our students. We also know that teaching is an emotional practice. Anybody that's been an educator knows that you either love your kids, you love your content, or you love both. Because if you don't, you can't do the job. We also know that that teacher and student learning and well-being are interconnected. I can tell if Johnny or Susie had a bad night the night before, just as soon as they walk through my door. I see a big head nodding in the front row. Exactly. You know how your kids are doing because you know based on their their nuances, based on their body language, based on what they're telling you, and based on what they're not telling you. We are connected as a profession. We also know that to uplift the people we serve, we also have to uplift the people who serve them. So if we want our students to be successful, then we have to help lift up our teachers. And one way that we can do that is to make sure that they have the tools necessary to do the job that they need to do. So how do you make that happen? Well, one way to make that happen is to think about how you can use the tools that you currently have and may, maybe consider bringing those new tools in when you are able to trade in those old tools. So I'm going to turn this over to Paula, and then we'll do a little bit of back and forth at the end as well. Thanks, Dr. Ray. Yep. You can make it down. You're <laughs> welcome. Hi. Um, I think we're afternoon now. Uh, my name is Paula Curry, and I'm with Second Life Mac. We're going to talk about the how and the why. Um, I worked at Apple for eight years, and uh, we studied Simon Sinek quite a bit, so always get to the why, right? I need the clicker. Yeah, there we go. So when I started over here um, at Apple, I wanted to know why people wanted to reinvest, why we wanted to take those Apple devices, whether you're a business, whether you're um, K-12 or higher ed. Um, but I didn't care when I built this team, I cared a lot about my team, don't get me wrong, but I didn't care what we thought. And a lot of us did come from Apple. Um, what I wanted to know is what you thought, what the tech directors thought, what the superintendents or managers of these devices thought. Um, so I contracted with Project Tomorrow, and Julie Evans is the CEO of Project Tomorrow. She presents in front of Congress once a year on the state of K-12. And so I said, Julie, talk to me and do this study around the nation of, of what 
is the state of K-12. Which era? There we go. All right, so the study methodology, we had 186 respondents in 44 states, so we covered the country. I wanted large, medium, and small. So our large districts, like Chicago Public, LAUSD, those operate very similarly, sorry, roll on the tongue. They're very similar to large accounts, right, to major accounts. So I wanted to know what they thought, uh, both public and private and rural. So. Um, what we found in analyzing this data was a lot of the things that Dr. Ray just talked about, right? So we spent all this money and it came back and it said student learning law, st staff morale, you have effective use of technology. And I'm like, Ugh, I just spent all this money to find out what we kind of already knew. Right? Tell me a little more here, Julie, right? So then, um, this was in 2019 when we had this study conducted. And at that time, in our school systems across the country, the vision of tech directors and superintendents was, we believe that 95%, if you fast forward into where we are now, right? It's always 2020 vision when you turn around and look now. Now, after the pandemic, we all have a one-to-one, -one, one device per student. So that's what we call a one-to-one. -one. But this was done in 2019. So I'm like, okay, that's tracking from what I know. Um, what are the roles and the responsibilities of these folks and what is Im important to these folks, right? What is important to a technology leader versus a superintendent? Or if you're in major accounts, like a public institution, what's important to the technology versus the management or CIO? So. Technology leaders, they wanted digital equity, right? What that told me was they were saying, look, I want each kid to have the same device. Um, funding was very important to the superintendent. So I wanted to know what was important to those guys. So that taught us um, you know, how to talk to different folks. Um, and then I said, let's, let's dig a little deeper. And this is where the disconnect came up for me, was that technology leaders in most of these districts that we polled would recommend what product to buy, versus if you go all the way down, um, only 15% of technology leaders said they had the financial responsibility of that. That typically, that decision, that financial decision came from the student, the superintendent. So when you have that disconnect, it's very concerning on what device we're going to go with, right? Um, so that, that became very important for us to focus on. And then what we do is we plan for success. So when we talk to folks, we go to schools and businesses throughout the country and we say, all right, how are you going to make the most of your Apple devices that you're sitting on today? Right? There's a couple ways that, that we make this happen. One is you get on a buying cycle. You get on a refresh cycle. Every three to four years, you refresh those. IBM has a huge case study of how the CIO um, enables his employees to stay on MacBooks and how that, that return on investment every three to four years when they sell back those, those MacBooks funds the next fleet, funds the next... Um, lease payment that they have. And the same thing goes for all the schools that, that we work with. Um, Apple Care is very important. Um, it drives your buyback experience up. So it, it drives that price up when you do buy Apple Care. Um, they have changed Apple Care in the last four years since I've left um, Apple, and it now is very much worth uh, the purchase price. If you run the numbers, the way we used to run the numbers is you can either say, okay, am I going to buy more Apple devices and have those sitting on a shelf, or am I going to buy Apple Care? And when we, as a buyback company, see that you've had Apple Care and you've taken care of those, that drives your price up. Some of our customers become uh, a GSX, so they service their Macs themselves. We see that in the larger districts um, as well. We're with you every step of the way, so we're talking to you from pickup to payout. And that's very important. If you look at the buyback business as a whole, um, there's a very low barrier to entry. So we have a lot of folks in this space, um, but the way Second Life Mac has built our company is we hire the best people to come out and talk to you about how this happens. And we put people behind the scenes that is with you every step of the way. So you know where your investment is, and then you, we pick it up, we audit it, 
and then we pay you. Um, it's a very simple process. This is not, um, we're not designing the next iPad. Um, we're funding so that you can buy those next iPads, right? Um, so key takeaways, your devices do have value. A lot of folks, um, this is still a new concept to a lot of folks that are out there. Um, like I mentioned at the very beginning, get to the why, right? Um, people, people, when we, we dug down in the study, when one of the things I really wanted to know is how often do you do a buyback? And 20% 20 in 2019, 20% of those school districts did a buyback. It was actually 18% did a buyback. That, and when I asked the question, why, you know what the number one answer was? Number one answer was, I don't know how. I don't do a buyback because I don't know how. Number two answer was, my stuff's not worth anything. Right? It's not worth anything. It's worth a lot. We actually look at leases, um, and this is either for major accounts or it's for K-12, and we have look at that in-year in lease, that third payment that you're making, and we oftentimes, we're not going to get you right there, but we are going to get you 75% of the way, and we're going to give you a check for that. And that is what enables you to sustain this higher value Apple technology. And that's the secret that people don't know. So when you back into this and you think about our school systems, first of all, across the country, and only four years ago, they didn't have enough money to get a one-to-one, -to, -one, to have one device per kid. Now they do. Now how are they going to sustain it? if only 20% knew how to do a buyback. So if you can get your company or you can get your district onto a cycle, and it is every three to four years, um, that, that's where the tipping point is, right? So the tipping point to buy back an iPad is every three years. That, that's when you're going to make the most money of your buyback and get into the right device for your kids, your students, your employees. And every four years we see for MacBooks. So those are the key takeaways for you. Every three years for iPads, every four years for MacBooks. And then um, we have a whole team of people. We have some great giveaways. We have this little monkey. I love the monkey, Colleen. I don't care what Colleen says. Uh, the monkey, it holds your phone, and then you turn it upside down, and his little bottom will clean your phone. So um, stop by our booth, and we'll talk to you um, We'll talk to you about how this all works. Um, we'd love to answer any of your questions, and um, we'd love to do business with you. So thank you very much for attending, and we've got a monkey for everybody. Oh, questions. Come on. I'll come up there. We do not, we do not have any on the, oh, the app, okay. so if you will just pose the audience. Any questions? Questions for us, guys? Back row. You've been talked at all morning, so it's lunchtime. We're between now and lunch. Oh, that's not good. No, not good. Thank you so much for being here. Have a good conference. Thank you. Thank you all so much. You know everything was kind of pushed back because of the delay of the keynote. So um, I was looking for a new time slot for the next session. I, it hasn't been announced to me. So there is food and coffee. I don't know if you saw it in the the alcove around the corner, uh, fruit and muffins and stuff. So take your bio break and take care of yourself. It was great seeing you. I hope you have a great conference. Oh, my session, our session um, is tomorrow. And if you're a Jamf school in